combination of the videotapes and we met's testimony resulted in the conviction of two men on extortion charges. One of them was Frank Schweiz, known in syndicate circles as the German, a feared mob terrorist and a suspect in a number of gangland murders. He was described to me by other outfit individuals as uh, the most feared hitman. And uh, as he said to me, my reputation precedes me, son. How's it going, Red? It's going. We made it here. And we, we have Jack with us, too. Jack Hayden. Hey, Jack. Yeah. I'm here. Say hi to the audience. We're live. Okay. Thank you for coming on my show, Jack. I really appreciate it. Um, Mr. Flowers, did you say that Mr. Hayden was in the military? Yes, Jack was in the Air Force. Uh, he was in the Air Force from what, what years again? 56, 57, 58? That's right. Right. So hit the like button, guys. Don't forget to do that. And uh, tell you a little bit about Jack. Uh, he um, has been an entertainer his whole uh, his whole uh, life. He was a uh, undertaker when you first uh, got went to college for you went to mortuary school, right? Yeah, I'm hearing about every fifth word, so I'm trying to put it together what you're saying. Oh. Yes, I was at mortuary college and I graduated. Yeah. Sorry, I moved the phone on you, Jack. Um, okay. Okay. So that's Jack, uh, the thumbnail that we put up. He knew Peter Lawford. And, uh, and, and the question is, what did Peter Lawford confess to Jack about Marilyn Monroe's murder? And we talked a little bit about this in, uh, in the previous hour on Mob Vlog. But, um, but before we get to, to all that, Jack, um, can you tell us a little bit about where you're from? A um, little bit what you did in a, a briefly? Yeah. Well, I'm from a little town upstate New York called Bunk, B-U-M-P, Bunk, New York. Um, it's a small community, only about uh, 14 travel trailers in a circle. And um, they only had, uh, no, there wasn't a traffic light or anything. It didn't even have a town hooker. They all had to take turns. But um, way up on the highway, there's only one traffic sign that they took possession of. Um, it said uh, a bump ahead, and uh, that's where I came from. So, and I was there for uh, oh, 17 years before I found out it was okay to leave, you know. <laughs> so, when you when you left, you went to uh, mortuary school to become an embalmer, is that right? That's right, in New York City, yeah. Okay, so he became an embalmer, and uh, you also uh, had a limo business, didn't you? Had a what? Limousines. Yes, I did. Oh, I had my, I bought a 1929 Rolls Royce limousine. It was my big toy. And I used to uh, take people to the theater, to dinner, to the airport. Yeah, I used to use it to make extra money when I was a student. That's a, and that's a picture on the screen right there, guys, of Jack in front of that uh, limousine. And his oh. chauffeur hat and all is on. Uh, is that the limousine that you drove Salvatore Dali around in? That's right. Salvatore Dali was one of my uh, steady customers uh, and uh, various others. Uh, and Salvatore Dali, on the steamed window one day, I dropped him off. He and his entourage of people at the St. Moritz Hotel, New York City. That's where he lived. And uh, as he got out of the car, he... With his finger on the frosted window, he drew a Salvatore Dali picture, and he signed it for Jack, signed Salvatore Dali. And as he walked up the steps to the St. Moritz, I'm sitting in my car with tears running down my face because my painting from Salvatore Dali was running down the window. <laughs> you know, back, back then, you know, people weren't running around with a camera in their hand all the time because... Nowadays, I was boom. A camera. If I'd had a camera with me, I could have taken a picture of it. But I'll never forget it. Poor Jack signed Salvatore Dali. Yeah. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> Long time ago. Man. So yeah. then you went into uh, under t a mortuary co college, right? That's right. Oh. And I practiced. I, I embalmed about 2,000 people before I joined the Air Force. About and then... 
You got into entertainment. Yeah, I was in special services in the Air Force. I was the master of ceremonies and comic magician and uh, second drummer for the orchestra in Pops and Blue, the world touring Air Force official show. There's we have a, a, a comment here, Jack. It says, Mr. Hayden, who were the famous people that you met and worked with in entertainment? I heard Bob Hope name earlier. Oh, my goodness. A lot of them. Uh, uh, Rosemary Clooney, uh, the Smothers Brothers, Rita Hayworth, Peter Lawford. Uh, lots of I have my resume has 31 major stars on it. Did you know Lucille Ball? Uh, I didn't work with Lucille, but I knew her because she invited me. I was in a show called Flesh and Feathers at the Eaton Rock Hotel in Miami Beach, a big production show, a lovely show. And I'm doing my stupid magic act, and I'm looking over at the front door where the maitre d' was, and I saw, my like, God, oh, there's Lucille Ball and Lucy Arnaz, the daughter, with her. Lucy was watching me doing magic, and she gave the maitre d' a card. When I went off stage to my dressing room after I finished, the maitre d' brought the card back to me. It was from Lucille Ball. Please come to my party, and she gave the address. And it turned out to be a, a nightclub called Obies, O-B, baby, I-E-S, Obies. And she had uh, rented the club and invited certain people, and I was a guest. I played backgammon with her through the night. And Lucille Ball gave me this advice that I never took, really. Uh, she said uh, to me, uh, your magic is funny, good stuff, she said, but get rid of it. You don't need magic. You're a funny stand-up comic. You need to dwell on that and get rid of the magic. Well, I kept the magic as a backup act, and I did stand-up. But she was very sweet, Lucille Ball. And by the way, for the people who only know her from television and movies, she wasn't that air-headed redhead who had a high voice and the stupid saying. She talked like a normal woman, and she had reasonable sense and all that. And her husband, Gary Morton, was with her because Desi, Desi Arnaz had been uh, dead quite a few years then. And uh, she was very sweet to me, Lucille Ball. So, Jack, um, oh, gosh, I, I'm gonna, I got to put this picture up and show you guys this. Uh, Jack uh, worked with not just uh, Lucille Ball or new Lucille Ball, but also Jack. Uh, there's a picture uh, with Jack with Joan Rivers and Andy yeah. Gibb. Andy Gibb, yeah. Joan Rivers. And then uh, here, there's a picture with Jack with Tiny Tim. <laughs> Tiny was wonderful to work with. And we got along great because he played the ukulele, as you know. He put a career on it. And I, since high school, also played the baritone ukulele, which is uh, uh, an octave lower than his soprano ukulele. So we played together between shows when the band and the girls, the dancers, went to dinner in the hotel. And, and as the ladies were cleaning up the showroom, Tiny Tim and I would stand out on stage and play ukuleles and sing stupid songs like uh, If You Can't Live Without Me, Why Aren't You Dead Yet? All those kind of songs. <laughs> the the tulips. And the hit that I wrote at that time was Take My Love and Shove It Up Your Heart. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, here's a picture of Jack in the Tops and Blues show. That's a very young Jack right there. Oh, boy, young, I guess. <laughs> As the MC of the show. And, oh, I found this to be fascinating, too. Uh, there he is on stage with the Smother Brothers. The Smothers yeah. Brothers. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what were you, what was that about? It looks like he's in a Superman well, outfit, and the other was, one's in a uh, at the, uh, rabbit. Hotel downtown, at the end of the strip there. What's the name of that hotel? Union Plaza, is it? Plaza, yes. That's where we were, and it was Halloween. We were doing a special Halloween show. That's why they are in costume. Gotcha. Okay. And, you know, I wanted to mention this to the audience, too. Um, that uh, Jack knew this Carmi right here. And this is Jack and Carmi when Jack was being presented into the Las Vegas Entertainers Hall of Fame. Remember that, yeah. Jack? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. It was, a moment, it was a moment in my life to be entered in the Las Vegas Hall of Fame as an entertainer. It's quite an honor, and I'm still 
impressed by it myself. And Carmi, he worked around in a lot of clubs. Who did he know? Oh, oh gosh, yes. He, he was in it for years. And I, before I ever knew Carmi, he was the first one I worked with in Vegas when I finally came to Vegas. And uh, Carmi had been in show business for many years. And uh, he also, uh, interestingly enough, he played Jack Ruby's club in Texas. Jack Ruby is the guy who, who shot and murdered uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, you know. And Carmi worked with a lot of stars, too. Well, what did he say Jack Ruby was like? He didn't say much about him. He said he was a very business owner, and he always sat at the bar watching Carmi's act and enjoyed Carmi. And they became friends. But Mr. Ruby apparently had the personality of a, a, a dead fish, you know. Yeah. He didn't laugh much and didn't complain about anything. And he didn't order anybody around. He was just there and he owned the club, you know. Speaking of a dead fish, that's Jack about to tear into a one and a half pound lobster tail. <laughs> I'm showing him a picture of you with this giant lobster tail in front of you over here at the house. Remember, yeah. you put yeah, that yeah, whole I damn do. thing away that night. You ate that whole thing. I couldn't believe it, man. I was like, he's got to take some of that home, right? Well, don't forget in show business, you've got many days of being quite hungry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Royal Jenner said hello, Jack. Hi, hi, hi. We have, we've been out. Jack, can you do a recap on? How you knew Peter Lawford? Uh, I worked with him on an ocean liner when we were working the Cunard Lines, which is British, and Peter was British. Yes. And so, um, and so, how, how did your relationship develop into friendship or whatever? Oh, very well for many years. We were good buddies, and I spent many times in his apartment in Hollywood with his fiance Pat Seaton, who he finally married. And uh, Peter and I called each other. One night, I was having dinner in Florida. My mother and father lived in Florida. And I flew there many times to visit them because I was on the road all the time and I didn't see my family much. So I flew to Florida, which I always take that night flight, the cheap one, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning flight. The red eye. <laughs> right? The red eye. Yeah, where everybody turns on their little light and they read for an hour and then they all fall asleep. And I think I shot the lady sitting next to me because I like to sleep in the nude. Ah. Yeah, I give her a shock. I was having dinner with my mother and father in Florida on Treasure Island. And uh, the phone rang and by golly, it was Peter Lawford. And I talked to him for a bit and I said, Peter, I'm going to take advantage of your good nature. Unless my mother is able to say hello to you, she'll never forgive me. So I handed the phone to my mother, and she talked to Peter for a while. And, uh, my God, she never forgot that, you know. But Peter called me often, and I called him often when we had something to say or something to share. So you well, knew what, did you tell you, what did he tell you about um, Marilyn Monroe? Well, I think I, I mentioned it uh, on this show earlier. The only one thing he's uh, told me is the fact that he got a scrambled call from the White House. Uh, they used a, Somebody used a phone scrambler to disguise their voice, I guess. And he didn't know who it was, but told him to get over to Maryland's house. She's dead and made and found her dead. And clean house before you call the police. Uh, pick up everything. Matchbook covers, uh, cigarette butts, uh, coins on the floor with possible fingerprints on it. Oh, anything, doorknobs, wipe everything. And he did that. It took him six hours to clean the house before he was allowed to call the police and say, Marilyn Monroe is dead. Come over here. Wow. So you think he did a very good job? Uh, apparently, because they never proved or never pointed to anyone that they found any evidence of. Right. And whoever, either she overdosed on drugs and booze, or they pumped it into her and killed her. They, whoever it was. I don't well, know. Jack, there was a, a book written, uh, Crypt 33, by my love, Spallegro. And in that hey. book, he said that the doctors were there, and after everybody left... These two men came in 
and they gave her a suppository of chloral hydrate. Yeah. Uh, they were probably, of course, CIA or FBI agents. Well, that's not, not according to, to, to what Red's information is. According to the book, Crypt 33, and according to what Frank Schweiss told me, they used a, a suppository to put her to sleep forever. To Possibly, kill her. yeah. Huh? Um, they, uh, they did a massive investigation, not only the county police, the city police, the CIA, and everybody else. And uh, an investigation even ordered by MGM, uh, a detective of some sort, uh, but they never found the exact proof of who was there and who killed her. But Peter, Peter said, yes, there were some other people there, but didn't know who they were. Okay. Others for, there. Your, for your information on me, Jack, Frank Schweiss used to sit in my living room and talk about all the murders. He, he was a, a hitman for the mob. Really? My gosh. Yeah. Wow. Adam's got tapes on some of them and um, undercover tapes that I did. Uh-huh. So, uh, uh, Marilyn uh, built a career on who she was and what she was, a gorgeous woman, of course, uh, and she wasn't exactly according to Peter, who knew her very well. They were very good friends, and I don't mean to be pejorative and now that she's dead i don't mean to put her down but she wasn't all that intelligent so she surrounded herself with intelligent people and was learning from them like peter lawford who was highly intelligent oh yeah he drank a lot though didn't he jack he drank and did drugs and that's what killed him he he took his own life by it just by over overdoing and he died in mount sinai hospital and on his hospital bed, he married his longtime girlfriend, Patsy. They became, and he died shortly after. That was Christmas Eve of 1985. But we were buddies for 12, 14 years after I worked with him on the ship. And on that show, we had June Allison, with whom he worked with a movie called Good News. June Allison and I became good friends also. I loved June. She was a sweetheart. And we had Rita Hayworth and Ann Miller, the great dancer from MGM. And that's where I met Peter. And from that moment on, he said, you're terrific. I'm sorry, I'm not blowing my own horn here. But he said, you're terrific. And we became buddies from that moment on. That that's sounds great. great, Jack. And there's a picture. That's him with uh, June oh. Allison that's on the screen right now. I remember uh, June Allison. That's just- June, I'm telling you. There's two stars, of all the 31 stars on my resume, not not including Peter, but June Allison and uh, Helen O'Connell were very, very close and good friends because June was fun and so was Helen O'Connell. Uh, Helen O'Connell, do you remember, for many years was the mistress ceremony of the Miss America pageant. Oh, yeah, Miss America pageant. And- and prior to that, her career started as the band singer for Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. But the Dorsey uh, brother. And I, uh, the first week that President Nixon opened up Cuba for American tourists after many years of being closed from the Kennedy administration, finally they opened it up, but we had limited places where the ship's passengers could go. And, uh, and we were met on the streets Almost every other street corner had a, a Cuban soldier with a machine gun. And we were allowed to go certain streets and only those streets. And they ushered us right into one of the hotels. Now, the, their strip had many hotels in the day, heyday. It was, uh, it was what people did to fly to Havana for a weekend. But all those hotels were closed by Castro and left one open. And we, Helen O'Connell and I went to see that show. And we almost got thrown out of the place because everybody who could do anything was in that show in Cuba. If you were Cuban, that was the only place you could work. Musicians, the, the band playing the show was about 60 men because there was no other place for them to play in Cuba. The dancers, there must have been 40 of them instead of eight or 10, you know. Wow. And on the big parade number like Vegas, the showgirls of the dancers, 
they go backstage and they put on this big on ornate headpiece and they come out and parade across like a showgirl, like a Vegas showgirl. Well, my God, they they enter on the left stage and exit right, and they go back and pick up something else and put it around their head and come out again. And they did that round, 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 round. And all of a sudden, towards the end, they had no showpieces to put on, so they come out with a birdcage on their head, a motorcycle tire, a, a, <laughs> a, chick, a dead chicken or oh something. My God. Something on their head. And Helen O'Connell and I start laughing. We were farting. We were laughing so hard. And the major D kept looking at us, these damned Americans, you know, making fun of our show. And they almost threw us out. They didn't, because they, they didn't want to start an international incident with the United States. But, so, but they kept coming over to quieting us, and Helen and I could not stop laughing. Because these <laughs> girls would parade out, go out one in, uh, side of the stage, come back in again with something else on there. Whatever they could pick up backstage, an orange crate, anything. And tried out again. It was the damnedest thing I've ever seen. And laugh, I couldn't stop. I still wow. laughed at it. <laughs> well, Helen O'Connell, and Julian Allison, and I became real, real good friends. Ah, uh, they gave her enough to kill three elephants, according to this uh, chloral hydrate uh, suppository. <laughs> Back to that. Uh, and 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 uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not looking in the comment section. Uh, wouldn't the colon absorb that into the bloodstream? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what would happen. But Joseph Brennan said earlier, I saw in the comments went by, that he's taken chloral hydrate himself. They used to call it Mickey's. Uh, you know, they put them in the drinks and people, you know, people's drinks at the bars and it gets the people, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it knocks them out, right? So anyways, he said he's taken it. If you, if you take enough of it, you could definitely... Uh, possible to 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 od on that uh in a suppository but but chloral hydrate he says corrosive so it must have been a whopping dose it would have burned i bet it would have um jack do you believe the only reason peter lawford was in the rat pack do you believe the only reason peter lawford was in the rat pack because it gave sinatra a connection to the kennedys uh, he did that, but he was in the Rat Pack long before that because Sinatra realized he was the president's brother-in-law and Sinatra wanted a, a, a mainstream to the White House and Peter was it. So Peter was a, a, a Kennedy associate by being a brother-in-law of the president long before Sinatra picked up on him. But he picked up on him for that reason. And he was married to Pat Kennedy, correct? Pat Kennedy, Jack Kennedy's sister. Yeah, um, they had three three children: Victoria, Sydney, and I can't remember the other name. So, so the Peter Lawford. When we talked about it on the last show, but but but, but on on my vlog, but he was ostracized by by uh, Frank Sinatra from the Rat Pack and also from Hollywood, right? Because he dated. That's correct. That's correct. One night, one night he went to Chasen's, a big restaurant in Hollywood at the time, still is there, and he was dating Ava Gardner. And Ava Gardner was Frank Sinatra's goddess. He, uh, oh, he, he wanted her tremendously to be a wife, and they finally did marry. But Peter Lawford was dating her, and they were sitting at the table at Chasen's. The maitre d' came over with a telephone in his hand said, Mr. Lawford, there's a call for you. And he plugged it in and gave Peter the phone, and it was Sinatra. said, if you ever date her again, I'm going to have your legs broken. And he slammed the phone down. Okay, and then they never talked again, but they did, right? Didn't? They, they did, because Frank Sinatra Jr. was kidnapped for big money ransom. Millions By the million. Beach Boys. Wasn't that the Beach Boys were involved in that? It might have. Yeah. Uh, Remember, it's too far back. They paid the ransom. The FBI set it up. Yeah, but uh, that's when uh, the only time that Sinatra ever called Peter after kicking him out of the Rat Pack was at that time because he knew Peter could get Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, to get all kinds of government people to find his son, and which Peter did. And that's the only time he ever talked to him again after the Rat Pack. And he called him like a buddy. 
Hey, I need you. Uh, my son's been kidnapped. I need uh, FBI help. I need CIA help. And Peter helped him, and that's the last he ever heard of him. So wow. I guess that, that Dean Torrance of Jan and Dean were best friends with Barry yes. Keenan, who, who kidnapped Frank Sinatra Jr. Yes. So that's the yeah. connection to the Beach Boys there. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh -huh. So I just yeah. looked that up quickly. But, um, yeah, Sin Sinatra was nothing but a wannabe gangster. Um, yeah, Red knows his stuff. Yes, <laughs> Red knows all this stuff. Isn't that well, great for uh, me? Uh, the mob started his career because when I was in high school, I took a girl, Marsha Dawson, on a date to a place called the Three Rivers Inn near Syracuse, about eight or nine miles outside of Syracuse limits. That was Sinatra was put in there early before anybody ever knew him by the mob because the mob owned that club and that started his career. Yeah. And he worked in all those mobbed up joints. Oh, uh, all of them. Yeah. All. yeah. Um, and that, but that, that's what built his career. And that's why Robert Kennedy said to Jack Kennedy, no, you're not staying at his house. He's too mob connected. Now, yeah. didn't he tear the house down? He was very upset. He had secret no, service he, quarters he, built. He, he spent a fortune, didn't he? Sinatra, Sinatra had built uh, uh, a big private room on the side of his house that did not exist before. He built it for Kennedy with a private entrance to a swimming pool. And he spent $81,000, according to Peter, building that room when they moved his, uh, his stay to Bing Crosby's house Sinatra was so mad, he tore that room down brick by brick by brick and ostracized Peter forever. Wow. So Sinatra so, had a temper, as you know. So. I mean, he used to punch out cameramen taking his picture. He had a, a, a short fuse temper. Well, didn't they? They did people have written about the fact that the reason he had bodyguards was not to protect him, was to keep the cameramen away from him. To keep people away from him, even the public. He, he, he was sued several times, wasn't he, for for striking cameramen? Oh yeah, he had several lawsuits. He also had several lawyers. But I was told that everybody was told that he kept bodyguards around him, not to protect him, but protect the the cameramen and whoever would come up and um, well, try to get information about him. It was. There were always uh, some kind of protectors uh, packing a sidearm inside their jacket, always around Sinatra. Is uh, the Don is right? Sinatra ran after outfit guys like some kind of teen groupie. He did. Uh, Mr. Fugazi said it's been said that Sinatra would only start fights when he had gangsters around him to hold to hold him back. You know, That's oh, I'm good. True. Yeah, that's probably quite true. You know, I would guess it is. Yeah, uh, Sinatra couldn't hold Dean Martin's jock as far as talent was concerned. <laughs> but but you know, who do you? Hey, who Peter do you? Was, who do you? Peter was thrown out of the rat pack, and I spent many times in his living room talking, and we went to dinner a lot. I was never to bring up the Sinatra story with Peter because it really, really it made him angry is because Sinatra killed Peter's movie career. And uh, well, I was to never bring that up, and I learned that early. We don't talk about Sinatra in this house. All right. Okay, Peter. Let's talk about the weather. Let's oh, talk wow. about Lucille Ball. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> Any Anything. <laughs> um, anything. Yeah. yeah, Mike Michael Graham, it was depicted in the, in the, uh, um, in the Godfather when the band leader uh, they gave an, an offer he can't refuse was a direct reference to big band leader Tommy Dorsey, who wouldn't let Sinatra out of his contract. That's yeah. Right. yeah, and he said in the movie, I ain't no band leader. He uh, started years ago, uh, Dorsey started years ago with uh, that band, and uh, that's how he started his career, uh, Tommy Dorsey. Um, Sinatra always was uh, fawning over Giancana. He shared a woman with him. Yes. Right. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, Marilyn, right? And Judith Exner, both of them. And Judith, and Judith Exner. 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 Right. Judith yeah. Exner. Water. 
Uh, hey, did Jack uh, can... did did Jack can... did Jack know Louis Belson? No. Nope. Hope that answers your question. Um so so those guys, you know, they, those those guys were all talented, but who do you think had more talent, Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra, Jack? Well, I thought I always thought growing up watching them on television, I thought they had equal talent, equal uh, celebrity possibilities. Both of them. I uh, I can't say one over the other. They were both just about as equal talented as I've ever seen. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Sinatra and Bing Crosby finally appeared together in a movie, High Society, but it took a lot of pulling teeth to make it happen. That's right. And on the set, they weren't friends, as I understand. <laughs> they weren't. No. Whoa. They were there for the money and to make the film. And they buddied up with each other when the camera was rolling. But after that, no, they didn't have anything to do with each other. Wow. You know, I don't know if you knew this or, or if you know anything about it. Uh, Gianni Russo said when he was 16 that Marilyn Monroe took his virginity. That's possible, I guess, because that's when she started. You know? When he was 16? Oh. Uh, it, it, well, and she was not too far away from that age herself, I guess. She would have been like 22 or something by then, wouldn't she? she? Yeah, but, yeah. but she, she was going after girl. She was in full bloom by that time, you know. I thought she was a kind of a play-up girl where she wouldn't really go for somebody younger, only somebody to help her career. It depends on how he was hung, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Jack. Good point. Good point, yeah. <laughs> I think she gave him a nickname, Donkey. <laughs> <laughs> Grace Kelly was in high society. Beautiful woman. Um, yeah. <laughs> did you meet Grace Kelly, Jack? That was that was Hollywood back in those years. You know, it was just. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, Jack. I you got cut off for a second. Oh. Um. Sorry about that. But um. Uh. Norma Jean had them all. Yes, she did. Uh. She, she, Gianni had it backwards. It was Marilyn Monroe that took his virginity. That's what he said. That's what he claims. Yeah, exactly what he said. Yeah. Probably because she liked younger guys. Oh, okay. 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 For a long time, I didn't believe it. Peter was younger than she was. and She dated Peter a lot of time. And they, as I said, they were good buddies. They what? had dinner at each other's apartment or houses quite often. Peter date dated her? Like, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. He bedded her, but he didn't wet her. He he bet her, but he didn't wet her. There you I go. I don't know. I have no answer for that one. Well, um, yeah, a actresses back in the day, they uh, definitely uh, they were gorgeous. Uh, Mr. Fogazi, William Moretti put a gun in Dorsey's mouth and said, either your name Either your name or your brain is going to be on this piece of paper. That's how Sinatra ended the contract. Wow, really? That's what was said. That's what was said? Wow. Well, your brain or your name is going to be on this. He started his career, actually. Wow. Wow. And, and, and as I told you before, I used to date uh, and played with her on an ocean liner in the same show, Helen O'Connell, who started her career as the band singer for Tommy Dorsey. The band singer, okay. Herman Spelcher, you read it wrong, Adam. Not Marilyn Monroe, but Martin Monroe that took Gianni's virginity. The guy's a <laughs> storyteller. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, that's possible, too. <laughs> Gianni may be telling the truth on this one. You, you know, Scott H., you never know. You know what I mean? It's... Uh, it's, Scott uh, H. I, I would say you're, he may be. Well, I mean, we're talking. We're talking. We got somebody to here that that yeah. actually knew these people in that era. I, you know, you don't. You don't. It's not every day that you get to ask questions to somebody that's eighty-seven that was in this business. You know what I mean? It just isn't. That was around these people. So, it's. Uh, if you guys have questions, please. Uh, you know, put them in the uh, side side note. So. Um, 
<laughs> what do you want to talk about now, Red? <laughs> Let Jack talk about his end. Jack, you and I were talking about, um, you had a story to tell about when you were entertaining on stage. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, before we started, before we went live, you were going to tell it. Adam, I only got two or three words out of that. It was all broken okay. up. What, yeah. is, what did he ask? Sure. So um, before we went live, you started to tell a story about performing on stage, and we said, oh, wait, 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 and tell that once we're on air and we're live. Do you uh, oh, you want to tell that? I don't remember. I've got so many stories about how, what was it about. Do you remember? It was about um, your your stage life. Your stage life. Yeah, when he's uh, actually a comedian, he was doing a show. You were doing a show as a comedian? Yeah. How you worked the audiences? Oh, worked the audiences, yeah. I had two mentors. When I was growing up as a boy, I was my four high school years, I was very much into Jack Benny, who I, I adopted his style to deliver a line to an audience, and because afterwards... Uh, Jack Benny was a mentor of mine, as was Carl Valentine, the magician who did comedy magic that I loved. And I still do that kind of magic without using his material. But that's how I became from a mortician to a comedian, because when I was in the Air Force, they put me on Pops and Blue, and that's entertainment touring the world, entertaining troops. And that's when I worked with quite a few stars. And uh, so I left mortuary science, even though I'm still licensed to practice. I can embalm today if I someday lay down. But I uh, I went into show business, and I've been in there since uh, uh, well, since uh, nine o'clock this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and still a comedian. Still. <laughs> you, I don't think you ever lose it. Most people say, oh, I'm 87 years old. Even though I lie to the audience, I come out and I say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jack. You can remember that by just uh, thinking of a flat tire. And <laughs> I'm 31 years old, and I can easily say that because I was born 87 years ago. So I'm, uh, I'm amazed that I'm still here at 87. But uh, I guess I'll come along for a few more years before I check out. I want to thank you for coming on my show, Jack. Okay, I'm glad to be here. It was fun. Hey, it, it's always fun, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah, it is. It is, is. It, you, you never know. I mean, entertaining, uh, entertaining's, you know, it's a, it's a talent. And, uh, you know, being a, being a showman, being a comedian, being a, what you did, and traveling the world. I mean, how many times did you go around the world on a cruise ship? Oh, my God. Cruise ships. When I got out of the Air Force after flying around the world, entertaining troops, I played the cruise ships and ocean liners all over the world for about 15 or 18 years before I went to nightclubs. Jack, some of the people are asking how long you were in the service and what branch. Uh, I was in the Air Force, and I was in for four years. From your, what year did you start? 1956? Something like that. The Korean War was winding down, I recall. I entertained in Korea the troops, but there was only about a year left of the Korean War before it ended, and then I didn't get out until 59 or late 58. I don't remember now. Uh, Air Force Air Force was the, the best four years of my life, actually. I'd like to do it again. Um, some people say Dean Martin embalmed himself. One drink at a time. Uh, well, that's, very, that's very clever. <laughs> Where were you stationed when you were in the Air Force? Uh, Washington, D.C., because I was on a touring unit around the world. I didn't have a base, but Washington, I was attached to the Pentagon, United States Air Force Headquarters. Hey, can you tell the story where you uh, every every day Jack was flying to a different place in the world and uh, yeah. and, and getting on the been these big airplane hangers and doing shows on the back of the flatbed trucks for all of these yes, that's th right. thousands and thousands of troops and uh, that were starved for American entertainment and Jack, you took off from a place and they had to put uh, paper on the windows 
so that you guys inside couldn't see where you were. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, I didn't get most of that sentence, but I think, yeah, I traveled in, every day. We didn't quite know where we were, but uh, we had an itinerary, of course, given to us by the Pentagon. But uh, we were one day, at most two days in any one location. And the nice thing about it, the Air Force show was scheduled, and it was our duty, our job, to entertain Air Force troops. Therefore, we flew from one Air Force base to another. And in between, when there was a Marine base, a Navy base, or an Army base, we'd land there quickly in the afternoon, do a show for them on the back of a flatbed truck or a stage outdoors, and get on to the Air Force base. So we always honored all four branches of service. Okay, and one time when you took off, they had put paper on the windows. Oh, yeah. Uh, FBI agents came on board when we were in the South Pacific. We were going to play Kwajalein and any way talk in those kind of places in the South Pacific. Well, we have air bases, but they're monitor bases. They're watching the skies. And there's very few guys on those bases, but they're there for two-year assignment. Well, we were hopping those uh, from Guam and all that, Okinawa. FBI agents boarded the plane uh, in the Philippines with us and taped brown butcher paper over all the windows. And we flew past a lot of islands with uh, military installations. Some of them were missile launching sites and all that. And then when we finished our shows, we we're headed back to the mainland states. Uh, the FBI agent said, well, you know, we can take these off. So they tore all the paper off the windows. And the pilot did a big circle over the Atlantic Ocean. And there's a big black spot. And the pilot got on the, uh, on the tube and said, uh, guys, look out the windows as we circle around this. That big black hole last week was an island. We blew it right out of the ocean. Wow. I remember that. Do you, ever, do you ever see those videos of uh, Atoll Red on YouTube where they blow up the thing out in the yes. ocean and, and that water yep. goes there? That's what he – that's got to be what he saw, the yeah, remains of. probably what we yeah. saw. Yeah, that's, that's pretty – The pilot didn't name the island that it was, but he said last week that was an island. We blew it right out of the ocean. Yeah, that's pretty uh, pretty wild. <laughs> well, <laughs> Jack, because, did you ever go – It's on the show, had – Secret uh, and clearance, not top secret, but we had secret clearance to be on that show. Right. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, Scott H. They nuked it. <laughs> that's what they yeah, did. Well, of course, of course, they nuked it. Yeah. 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 Testings. So this guy's a genuine American hero. Thanks, Jack. We love you. Okay. Thanks for being around. I'm I'm very <laughs> grateful for this. It was a lot of fun. Bye. All right, Jack. We'll see. We'll have you back on a, a, another time. Okay. All be right. Sure I'm al- be sure I'm alive. Oh, we'll be sure that you're alive when you have oh, you on. Bye. God bless you, Jack. <laughs> okay. So, Red, that was uh, pretty damn interesting, huh? I think it was, yeah. I think uh, because it was on your show, too. Jack was on your show. Bring him over on this show. There's probably more information on your show than there is on this one. But he still gave us what we wanted to hear, his involvement. Yes. And it's uh, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be, uh, um, I think, a good, uh, I think it's going to be a good show to, to look back on to one day and go, here's some information that we're not going to ever get again. He's 87. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's It's like, so I'm in front of a green screen, guys. So, yeah, my hair is not perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, Trace will definitely have him on again. Uh, <clears throat> awesome guest. Thanks for bringing him on. Hey, Jim Magnifici. Um, yeah, thanks for listening because, you know, this is what, uh, it's what it's all about. It's great history, you know. Adam knows Jack, and, and I asked him, I said, do you think we could put him on my channel because at the after party because there are so many things to do on Adam's channel and – we couldn't get it all in. So yeah, that's why it's done this way. Let's carry it over a little bit and, uh, you know, carry it over a little bit and, uh, you never know. So, so what's for dinner? <laughs> uh, baked chicken. There you go. Um, baked chicken. 
I have a tour to do. I want to thank all you folks for stopping by on, on the after party. Thank you very much. Everybody in the uh, U.S. Navy, U.S. Nevada survived Pearl Harbor Day, D-Day, Operation Dragoon, and Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and then used as a target in the Bikini Atoll test, sank finally by the Iowa-class battleships in 1948. Interesting, Bill. I did not know that, that the USS Nevada went through all that and was sank. Wait a second. It wasn't sank in the Atoll bomb test either? It was no. sank by the Iowa-class battleships in 1948? What's the Iowa-class battleships? I don't, it's an Iowa class. Um, okay. They had different classes by the state. Let me make a comment here. Uh, Joseph Brennan Jr., um, I got your change of address and um, your emails, and I asked to respond to my email and make sure it was correct for your autographed book. Um, awesome. We're going to have... Dwight Eisenhower, Oscar Goodman would be a great guest. He would do it too. I don't know if he would, but yeah, it would be an interesting guest, I think. I talked to Wade about him coming on the show, and yeah. he said he doesn't do any shows. No? He wouldn't do it. He approached <laughs> him for me. Interesting. USS Iowa, USS Missouri, USS New Jersey, and USS Wisconsin were the Iowa-class BBs. Yes, they were. You're welcome, Joe. Yes. So what an interesting subject. You know, the whole <laughs> time with Peter Lawford, JFK, that's all yeah. such a wild, twisted web. RFK, Robert and Kennedy. RFK, yeah. The whole thing's such a twisted web that you look at and you go, well, why is it? Uh, why is it hard to believe that this could have, you know what I mean? Some that people won't accept, uh, don't want to accept that it was a, a murder and she killed herself. And you know what I mean? I, I was, when I, until I heard it from Schweiss, I really didn't believe it. But after I heard it from Schweiss, I saw it in a book. Yeah. Hit the so, like button, guys. Yeah. After Schweiss told that to you. Yeah. You saw it in the book. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there was an FBI agent at the time um, that I didn't like. And um, he turned around and says, after he, he was he saw the tape, he reviewed the tape with me. And he says, the next thing you know, you're going to tell me who killed Kennedy. Yeah. And I just said, uh, I don't want to touch that one. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Nevada survived being 6,000 yards from the first bikini test blast. Bill Kirchmayer knows a lot about this. Um, it's so it survived the, the test. Wow. That's pretty wild. I mean, that, that ship went through all that and was, was that a good captain, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and backup crew. Yeah. Good crew. Good captain. Good crew. Iowa class had 2,700 men. And officers and 33 knots of speed. Wow. Thank you, Jim. So what a um, fascinating, fascinating life Jack had, too, going around the yes. world. Jack had a very fascinating life. Yeah. It must be difficult to be retired like he is, 87 years old, and not really to be active. Jack is uh, a remarkable individual. Very remarkable. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at the comments here. Are you? So. <laughs> uh, not cheap. All the people involved, JFK, RFK, Maryland, were sicker, were sicker people than anybody suspected at the time. I believe that. At the time, I mean, at the time, it was a very uh, guarded thing. So all, the, all these secrets were guarded. In 1962, they didn't even talk about that kind of stuff. 
What do you mean they were sicker people than anybody suspected? Sicker how? Like mentally? Well, in, in multiple affairs, you know, they, they slept around a lot. They did things that weren't really accepted at that point in life. At this point in life, in 2022, people accept different things in a different way. Even when you were born, whatever. It's changed a lot since 1962. Sure, of course. A lot in that in that year in that era, a lot of people would say that's sick. That's sick. It wasn't accepted. Gotcha. But today, what they did was probably more common. Just more common. That's all. Oh, people sleeping around. Yeah. Well, it's stars having affairs. Yeah. Uh, Politicians yeah. Uh, getting into pipelines, you know, <laughs> with the media, whatever. Yeah, 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 I guess so. Yeah, I did not have sexual affairs with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Kirschmeyer, I know nothing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, has it changed, Harvey Weinstein? No. It was Hollywood uh, Babylon. Yes, exactly. It's exactly what it was. So No, it evolves, Scott H. It evolved. Would be nice to offer autographed pictures of Mr. Hayden. Would you like an autographed picture of Mr. Hayden? Because I might be able to get you one, Anthony. I think I could. Um, let's see. As a matter of fact, I got to send something to Jack anyway. I could ask him to, because he's got to send something back to me. So I could ask him to put it in with that. Let's. Homan, uh, Homan, who do we have here? Uh, Herman Spelcher. Here's the thing. It's highlighted more today because of social media and everyone has a camera on their phone. Oh, yeah. I agree. Sure. It was going on back then. Sure it was, right? It yes. just wasn't, wasn't as. It just, you know. Well, and not only that, it was more. You know, they even bring it up today as a cliche. 50s lifestyle was very different. Very, very different. Yeah. Wow. The wreck. The wreck was rediscovered in 2020, 650 miles southeast of Hawaii in 15,000 plus feet. Wow. 15,000 feet down? Man, you're, you're sending robots down there. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> A bat so school, uh, what do they call them? Bath schools, what Where they go down, yeah. Like, uh, uh, I don't know what they're called, but yeah, the uh, underwater drone they could take picture. No, they're bath schools, bath schools, bath schools, yes. You get into them, it, it takes pressure up to, I think it's, um, uh, I don't know how far it goes. I know they they practice with them in the Mariana Trench. Uh, to see how far they can go, and people can go down in them. Rascal, I'm not finding this. Here it is. Scott H has got. Scott H. Bath Escape. Okay. Bath Escape. Thank you, Scott H. I didn't pronounce it properly. And yeah, the street go. story I says it's. Anthony says it's. Okay. I can't pronounce it right, Anthony. Uh, Bathscape. Yeah, I, I got it right here. It's Bathscaff. 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 Hold on. Bathscaff. 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 There you go. Bathscaff. So, so it's a it's an underwater. You know, they have something like a national geographic they don't have any like uh, unmanned things to go down now days they mean, have to go down on this they can go more than ten thousand meters yes thirty five thousand feet yes and how deep did he say that 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 it was found the 22 15 thousand plus plus feet right here so we that's easy to, yeah wow I wouldn't want to be in there. I wouldn't either. <laughs> that man. That's I I knew a man. I knew a man that designed them, and he had a top Navy top uh, a top a secret clearance, and he used to work off a trench that was in between the Bahamas and uh, Miami, Florida, and they went down very deep. They don't know how deep that trench is. 
It's no. right outside the Bermuda Triangle. They can't. They don't, whoa, really? Yeah. So there's a trench that we don't know how deep it is. Right. That's near what the, they told me. That's what he told me. And he worked for, over with the radar, sonar. Got to go down there and bounce back up and tell you how deep it is. Well, if you got cloudy water, it's going to bounce off whatever's you know down there. But he told me with the best equipment that they had, and he had some very strange equipment. He really did. Very nice guy. Yeah. He was actually born in Hungary, but he worked for the uh, government here in the United States. Hmm. Very nice man. I met him down when I lived in Palm Beach. The cow goes moo, the pig goes oink, and Adam Googles go <laughs> bathyscaphe. <laughs> well, Joseph, uh, Brennan. he said it's seven miles. That's seven miles. Seven miles. Oh, well, my buddy Roy's not on, or I could ask him how many feet seven miles is. He'd tell me that in a heartbeat. Yeah. How many feet seven miles? Let's see. Uh, 36,960 feet. Damn. That's, yeah. that's pretty, that's pretty far down. Yeah. You know, all that pressure in the water. I mean, it'd crush anything. You'd think it'd crush anything. Maybe so, it, well, anything, unless it's made to, to sustain it. Yeah. They have ROVs that can go to the bottom of the Mariana trench. I would think so. It's only, yeah, only 3% of the ocean's bottoms have been explored. That's crazy. When you think about that, isn't it? Only yes, it is. percent. That's it. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's it's crazy. So, well, Adam, why don't we say goodbye to the folks? Okay. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you, Thank folks. You, it's been Thank you, fun. Adam. Hey, Thank you're you. welcome, Red. And uh, let's uh, let's play something here to take you out. Uh, and and you coming on Monday or no? Yes, I am. You're gonna do a Monday? Okay. Yes, I am. Well, then, everybody, you can tune in Monday and see Red. I'm going to be busy, though, on Monday. I won't be here with him, but Red always, always does a great show. So, Red, adios. The combination of the videotapes and we met's testimony resulted in the conviction of two men on extortion charges. One of them was Frank Schweiz, known in syndicate circles as the German, a feared mob terrorist and a suspect in a number of gangland murders. He was described to me by other outfit individuals as... Uh, the most feared hitman, and uh, as he said to me, my reputation precedes me, son.